Well, I want to welcome everybody uh, this afternoon uh, to I don't know how many installments this is of Grace for Today, but this is Grace for Today. It's the ministry of the Grace Bible Church. I'm Pastor Lee Cruz. This is May the 7th. Uh, we're on Thursday. I hope that you're having a good day. I understand that while we've had a little bit of sunshine, the weather is going to come back and it's going to be cold. Let me just make a few short announcements, if I can, for those members that are part of our, our church. We will be having another drive-in service at the same location of uh, Tim Short's Chevrolet or the old Howard Early Chevrolet Garage that's on the corner of... Uh, uh, Maple Expressway and Veterans Parkway that's right before you get to I-64. Uh, the Chevrolet garage there, we're in that parking lot. You'll be able to pr pull in. You can't get out of your cars. But we've had excellent uh, attendance there uh, the Sundays that we've had those services there, and so we're having another one. Uh, then the next Sunday, which will be on the 17th of May, we will be having a drive-in service, same place, if the weather permits. Now, if something should happen, even this Sunday, if the weather would be so bad that we could not have it, then we will do a live stream at 9 o'clock in the morning from our church. If, if we're able to have the service, then we will record the service uh, there on the, at the parking lot, and uh, we'll be able to send it out. It won't go out straight out at 9 o'clock. It'll go a bit later. Uh, so anyway, that will happen. Then on the 24th of May, we'll be able to, for the first time, to go back and start having uh, church services uh, in our church. We are going to have our plans now at this time uh, is to have um, is simply to have two services, uh, and on those services, um, the, the services that we're going to have, one will be at nine, one will be at eleven o'clock. Uh, families will be able to set together, immediate families will be able to set together. Uh, every, other people will be, will keep everybody six foot apart, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to spread everything out. This is why we're having two services and trying to uh, meet the needs of everybody so everybody can come. I know that there will still be people that, uh, that will, uh, are still afraid to come out, and, and for various reasons, and I understand that. And so if that is the case, we will still stream those services at 9 o'clock. Uh, only thing I want to do, guys, is just get this thing over with so that we can get back to what we were doing. I'm tired of hearing people talk about we'll get through this. I'm tired of hearing people say, uh, you know, that we're a team and working through all this. Well, in some ways we are. I understand all that, but I'm just tired of it. And I think a lot of other people are tired, too. It's time I think we got back to work. I think it's time that we trust the Lord. You know, there was a time uh, when uh, anything happened to this country, the first thing that was said, let's pray. Now today, everything I hear is about science, about how we're going to find a vaccine and everything else, rather than let's pray. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, there has never been a time, uh, I believe maybe in the history of this country, that we need to pray. There's never been a time that we need to take Second uh, Chronicles 714, which basically says, God's saying to if my people, my people uh, would um, seek my face and pray and, and, and pray and seek my face and will uh, confess their sins, then you tell us simply that you will heal our land uh, and forgive us of our sins. And so, Lord, man, how we need uh, we need this more than anything else right now. We need uh, to really come to a place as a country and we need to simply come to a place that we really take Second Chronicles uh, seven fourteen and take it take it to heart. Let me read that again to you, so because I probably misquoted it. But listen, listen what it says here. It says that uh, seven seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sins and heal their land. And I believe that's more important today than it ever has been. So uh, but so I, we will have those services, and I hope that you will attend. Well, let's go to the Lord and pray at this time. Well, Father, I thank you for your blessings. And I thank you, Father, how you love us and care for us. I pray for those that are out there today that are dealing with all kinds of complications and problems. Lord, may they come to you and give all this over to you. May they cast all their care upon you because you care for them. 
may they may they hear what Jesus told us in in uh, John 16 verse 24 when he says hitherto you've asked nothing in my name ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full may we hear what John wrote in 1 John chapter 5 verse 14 15 that says this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us and if we know that he hears us we know that we have the petitions that we've asked from him and that's present tense may we hear once again the words of jesus when he says to us ask and it shall be given unto you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you for everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh findeth and he that knocketh it is opened unto him lord may we seek your face while it may be found may we go upon our knees today and and this time whoever i'm talking to and may they seek you like never before may they cry out to you because i believe father you will hear us when we do that and i ask all that in the mighty name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Well, I want us today to go over to uh, Psalms 32. And, and when we look at this country and we think about the problems that we have, I believe more than anything else, maybe one of the greatest problems that we have in this country is a moral problem. We, we're we calling those things that appear that we know or that we know for sure that are wrong. We're calling those things that are right. And we're calling those things that we know that are correct and right, and we're calling those evil. And so uh, how we need to come to a place that we really take a long, good, hard look at ourselves and what we're doing, how we're doing as a country, as a nation, as families, as, as individuals, and may we come to the place that we surrender our love to you, our, our very soul and our body over to you. Well, listen to what it says in Psalms 32, and there's only about five verses here. But um, uh, and listen what this says. It says, "Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven." What a wonderful thing it is to know that your sins are covered, to know that your sins have been forgiven. There's a great verse in First John chapter one, uh, verse nine, that says to us that if we will confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's God's promise to you. He tells us that he will separate us from our sins. He will separate our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. What's he saying to us? That they're no longer part of us. And you know what the word covered means? It means to no longer be in existence, to be gone, to be taken away. He will forgive us, but he'll also cover our sins and take them where they're no longer part of us. Now, David goes on as he writes this, and he said, uh, he goes on to say, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Blessed is that man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Well, the word impute means to be put into account. And he's saying, Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not take sin and iniquity and put into his account. Now, if you read the story in the life of David, we know what a great man he was. But he also, almost four times in Scripture, David said this, I have sinned. I had a lady ask me one time, ask me this, how can the Bible say that David after, had a heart after God, after some of the things he, he'd done, after he had uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba? and took her husband, Ura the Hittite, had him put at the front of the battle so he would be killed. It was the same as a murder. How could, how could David, the Bible, say that David had a heart after God after doing that? Well, I believe there's two reasons. First off is this reason, that even after David did those things, it had gone on for almost a year between the time that he had actually sinned with Bathsheba and had her husband killed, until the time that he thought everything was covered. They had all their bases covered. And this is what people do when they, they got involved in something that they know they shouldn't do it. And now they're trying to hide secrets and all kinds of things. I never will forget one time my dad uh, my dad ran a gas station for a lot of years. And, and I went was sitting with him one night. And there was a guy that came in. And, and uh, my dad came back and he sat down by me. And here's what he had to say. He said, you know... He said, when people are doing things they shouldn't do, because evidently this man was having an affair with somebody, he says, they think that nobody knows. He says, but their whole personality and things change, and I really believe that. And so David, for about a year, thought he'd had all this, all his bases covered, 
And yet the old prophet Nathan came to David and he tells him a story about a man who had a, a little lamb that he'd raised, probably bottle fed or whatever. And his next door neighbor, his next door neighbor had thousands upon thousands of sheep. And so when he, his next door neighbor decided he wanted to have a big barbecue, rather than him going and getting one of his lambs or one of his sheep, he went and he took the man's only lamb that he had and he brought him back and he had it killed to be barbecued. And when David said, saw, heard this story that Nathan was telling him, David was incensed. And he said, you tell me who the man is and he will pay it back fourfold. And it was at that point that Nathan took his finger and he poked it right in David's face. And he said to him, you're the man. Now, there's a lot of people that what they would have said was, no, I, I didn't do anything wrong. Or, well, if you only knew where I've been through and on thing, and they would begin to justify their sin. But not David. No, David looked Nathan straight in the face and he said this, I have sinned. I have sinned. And the truth of the matter in that story, David pronounced judgment upon himself because, yes, he paid for it fourfold because he lost a daughter that for had been raped he lost uh, uh, another son that was killed he lost his baby son and then finally his his beloved son Absalom was killed and David lost four he paid the judgment for it so that's one reason I believe that David had his heart after God because when he was confronted with his sin he always confessed it and said I have sinned now, there's another reason I believe that, that David was had a heart after God, and that was he wanted the same things that God wanted. If you remember the Ark of the Covenant, Saul got, uh, got tired of it, just left it in one place and didn't even bring it to Jerusalem. Actually, it stayed there almost 20 years. But David decided he wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, and he brought it. The first time, he put it on an ox cart and did it bad. But then after he'd really read the book of Leviticus and found out exactly how they were to carry the Ark of the Covenant, he brought it. So David had a heart after God. But now he says this. He says, Blessed is that man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. I believe that with all my heart. Now think about this. It's not saying if the man has done something wrong, then why would not God impute that iniquity? Why would God not put that iniquity in his place? He said, Blessed is man, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. What's he saying? He's saying that the Lord does not charge him with that sin. That's what he's saying. He doesn't charge him with that sin. And you know, I, I, I believe David was looking to our time. He was looking to a time that Jesus was going to come and Jesus was going to pay for every one of our sins. I had someone even ask me today about some things about uh, about certain sins, and they asked me, said, well, Lee, do you really believe that certain sins can be forgiven? Do you believe somebody that has committed murder uh, would be forgiven? Well, let me just read something to you, and this is found over in the book of Corinthians chapter 6. He says this, do you not know that the righteous, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? I, I'm sorry, I'm reading this from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, verse uh, starting with verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it says. If we just stop right there, you say, boy, Lee, I'm, I'm, I'm done because of those sins are listening. Me too. Those sins are listing who, who we are and list what we've done. And some people may say, well, man, that, that's me. I'm done for. But don't stop there. Keep on reading. Listen what the Word of God says in verse 11. And then it says this, And such were some of you. And such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says. That was some of us. There will be people in heaven one of these days that's committed some of those sins, but they were rewarded. They were justified because they came to Jesus. And so David looked to our day, and he was so thankful that the day would come. The day would come that that 
that Jesus would pay for all these sins and that no longer would the Lord impute that sin to us to put it to our charge, put it on our account. Now, maybe I'm talking to some people out there today that's done some things that you think nobody else knows about, but it's eating on you. It's causing you more problems than you know what to do with. It's causing you a lot of sleepless nights. Because that sin is, you know, as David said in Psalms 51, after he had committed that sin with Bathsheba, he says, my sin is ever before me. Maybe that's it. He also said in there, restore the joy of my salvation. Uh, you know, and there is no joy when, you know, you're looking over your shoulder. You're, you're worried that someone will find out. You're worried that somebody can do it. Rather than coming to the Lord and giving it over to him. Now listen to what the rest of this has to say. It says, In whose spirits there is no deceit. There is no deceit. What does that mean? It means we're up front with Him. You know, the only way that the Lord will really have a relationship with you is that when you're really who you really are, not who you want to be, not who you hope people see. No, it's who you are. That's the only person He wants to have a relationship with. Even that sinful person, he wants a relationship if you'll be upfront and honest with him. But listen to what it says in verse 3. It says, and because here's this person that has done something, and they've done it, and now they're word sick, and they're afraid everybody's going to find out. And, and, and now look, look at the effects of this person who has unconfessed sin in their life. Listen to what it says. When I kept silent, this person wouldn't, you know, I thought nobody knew whatever, you know, and I kept silent. My bones grew old. I just didn't feel good all of a sudden. I just didn't feel good. Though my groaning all day long for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. For my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. This person is, is heading into illness. Why? Because there's such things called psychosomatic illnesses that a person ends up uh, making themselves sick because of the fact they've got something going on. Uh, and my vitality, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Verse five, but and so he's saying I've got all this and I just don't feel good. Why? Why? I heard a story one time of a man that was always seemed like he was always depressed, and his wife finally talked him into going to the doctor. And he went to the doctor, and the doctor prescribed all kinds of pills and medicine. And when that didn't work, uh, the doctor then sent him to a uh, sent him to a psychiatrist. He goes to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist threw session after session, and that didn't work. And finally, they started using shock treatments on him, shock treatments of trying to get him to come to the place and admonish who he is and, and, and get him to really, uh, um, you know, to maybe try to help him get over this. And then, uh, finally, he was put into a, a mental institute, and it was there while he was there that the thing finally was ironed out. And what they discovered, this man was a businessman in a company, and he'd been embezzling funds. And as a result of that, he'd taken all that in, rather than confessing it, rather than coming out front, he'd gone through all these this pain and this agony in his life. Because what this says is, listen, let me read it again. When I kept silent, my bones grew old. Though my groaning all the day long, for day and night, for day and night, my uh, day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. But now listen to what it says in verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And listen to what this says. And here's what I want you to hear if you're in this situation. Listen to what it says. You and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Oh, the Lord knows it. He knows that we're nothing but dust. And he knows that we screw up and he knows that we sin. But what he's interested in is when we do those things, will we come and will we admit it? Will we admit to him that we have sinned and we've fallen short of his glory? You know what? The, the, when the Bible says in, in Romans 3.23, when we all sin and fallen short of his glory, what is his glory? His goodness. This is why Jesus had to come. Jesus didn't come so to make us better people or whatever else. No, he came for a simple reason, to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to die for you, 
Jesus not only forgave you of your sins, he became your sins. And not only that, he lived the perfect life that you and I could not live. And thank God that God takes his perfect life and he substitutes it for my fouled up life. That's what he does. Oh, my friend, why do you worry? Wouldn't it be great just to be truthful, to let everything, let your, as old boy said, let your hair hang out and just realize that God wants to have a relationship with you, but the only way he'll have it is when you come and you confess and say, Father, I need to come talk to you about some things and I need to get this off my chest. Now, there's sometimes that God will tell us when we've done something that we shouldn't have done. We've heard other people that we need to go ask for their forgiveness. But I pray today that if you've got something in your life that you need to get off your chest, you need to get taken care of, that you'll do that before it's everlasting too late. I hope that you'll do that. Well, let's pray together. Well, Father, I'm praying today, especially for someone out there that has messed up. Well, Lord, how many times have I messed up? How many times have I had to come to you and say, Father, I have sinned, just like David did? Well, Father, I pray that you'd forgive us of our sins, and you said you would. And he said, if we would come and just reason together with you, though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Oh, Father, I pray that this person would come and relieve all that pressure off of them and, and feel the, the joy and the peace that God wants them to have once again. So, Lord, if there's someone that has got something on their heart and nobody knows about, but they know, but here's this key, you know. So, Lord, I pray that they would come and confess that to you and give that over to you. How wonderful it is that you love us even when we sin, that you love us not just when we're trying to be good or trying to do what's right, but you love us even when we screw up. Thank you for that, Father. I pray for all those out there today, and I pray, Father, very soon that we'll be able to be back in church and be able to have fellowship again and we'll be able to touch one another again and have the right hand of fellowship. We can't even shake hands. So, Lord, please, I pray, be with us. Lord, when I fail to give you the praise and the honor and the glory, and I ask all this in the name of Jesus and for his sake, amen. Well, I pray that you'd have a great day, uh, the rest of this day, and, uh, and the Lord be with you, and may he make his face shine upon you. And I ask all that in the wonderful name of Jesus. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. God bless you.